Good morning, and I think all our choreography is in place, so we can begin. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you all for coming out on a very, very rainy, miserable Brussels day um, to join us for our final event for a two-year piece of work entitled Better Work for Immigrants, Tackling Joblessness, Stunted Progression in the European Union. This is a two-year project, and actually the culmination of three years of planning, as some of us in the audience, some of those in the audience will know. Um, and a joint project between MPI and the International Labour Office that we're very proud to present. The goal of this project was really not just to look at employment for immigrants, but think about the quality of work for immigrants in six different countries, France, Germany, the UK, the Czech Republic, Spain, and Sweden, and really understand how immigrants progress through the labour market over time. Uh, many of you will see the many papers that we've published on the website over the last several months. Um, and today, the final report has been published, and you'll hear more about those results. But first, to sort of introduce the topic as a whole and to give us a sense of why this is important for the European Com Commission, um, I would like to invite Georg Fischer, who is the Director of Analysis, Evaluation, and External Relations and the Directorate General for Employment, Social Affairs, and Inclusion, to give us a keynote speech. And one final note that I've been asked to mention is we have a hashtag, which is migrant jobs. So if you feel the urge to tweet, please give in to that urge violently and tweet as much as you can. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Georg. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. The weather is not so good, but at least we're in a beautiful building. I mean, if we were in a commission building in addition, you wouldn't have this beauty of the old town. I mean, you're in a very historical grounds. The, this part of Brussels was actually built, I think, by the Austrian Habsburgs. <laughs> so I have some personal, I'm not personally related to them, but at least I'm coming from Austria, so that's some sort of relationship. But anyway, it's a beautiful part. If you have time, look around. There are some beautiful museums. Anyway, the, maybe the most beautiful museums of Brussels around, but also beautiful little churches and streets boutiques, but I don't want to encourage you not to participate here. So this is for after the seminar, not, not for now. Uh, it's an honor for me to introduce this seminar. Uh, I should say, I think it's for me, having looked through the results, unfortunately only very briefly, uh, it has confirmed what we were hoping by putting together the MPI and the International Labour Office, we would have a very interesting and creative and innovative research cooperation. And I think this has fully proved uh, correct. Our expectations was very much wet, and I would even say you went further than one could have thought. And this is very good because an issue like migration, of course, in I have a few numbers here, which are rather gloomy, and if one reduces it to these few numbers, one might not need to think very much, but if one tries to understand what is the story behind these numbers, of course you come to rather complex and uh, difficult relationships, and for that I think the MPI and the ILO, the MPI as an institute which one can probably say has global experience in migration research is one of the few, I would say, with all the experience from the, and from the work in the United States, which of course is very relevant for us, although not directly comparable. Then the MPI has decided to move to Europe. So we have now sort of a bit of MPI also in Europe. That I think is a very good partner for the International Labour Office and again global organization that looks at Migration, of course, very strongly with a labor market perspective. The second point I like very much is what you had already said before. Uh, we are not just looking at employment, yes or no, which of course is crucial, but also what kind of career progression migrants can make. And we know again from the analysis in many other parts of the world that there is one question in what job a migrant enters the labor market, but then what is happening 
later on, and this is of course a very important question, and we also know this <coughs> from our own families maybe who used to migrate also. I mean, many Europeans are in fact from a migrant background. I mean, it's not a privilege of the US. We have many Europeans who moved from one part of Europe to another, or even moved to other parts of Europe, to other parts of the world and came back. So we know that it is not only a question of the first job, it is very much the question of the type of professional development one can approach. Uh, so we are happy to have such an interesting project. We are happy to have two very respected and distinguished organizations working together, but of course everything depends on the people. So I would like to see that we are also very happy to have a very good research team here working on all this. Uh, I would like to be honest with you that of course the moment, at the moment in Europe, not everybody looks very favorably at the idea that Europe would need more migration. Many feel we have huge amounts of unemployed. So why do we need to talk about migration? Why do we need to think about migration? Why do we need to act politically in, on migration? Except maybe in the sense of security, but for that my director general fortunately has no responsibilities. I'm not going into this. But I have to say that the new commission uh, has not shared this view. The new commission has made a compact for the way how the program in the European Commission, the, the statements by the president of the new commission, Mr. Juncker, structure, has made a comparatively strong point on migration. He wants to have a five-point plan on immigration. And he uses interesting words like to meet the increasing demand for skills and talents. And he uses words like a European policy on regular migration, skill shortages, attract the talents that it needs. And they also want to address the shortcomings of some of the existing policy tools the EU has. And then there is a very interesting phrase this is apparently what we want. We want to make the European Union an attractive place for migration destination, which is an interesting idea. And I must say, of course, previous commissioners or previous commission documents might have said this, but I wouldn't say it was given such a prominence in the declarations at the beginning of, of a commission. So this rather sort of cautious view is maybe not necessarily shared by the new commission president and the new commission. And there are good reasons, in a way, to focus on this. I think one has to admit, and I hope my colleagues from other parts of the commission don't mind if I say this in these words, that despite of all our efforts, and I think we did a lot, I mean, on new directives, new policies, we didn't really succeed to a large extent to or we made some progress, but not the progress the Commission President would like to say, in attracting skills and talents, in particular people with high levels of education. Although I think we did quite a bit, but we, we still have a, have a challenge here. But we have, of course, also another challenge, which is maybe more burning and more reflected in the title of today's seminar, and this is the fact that we don't manage very well to get migrants into the European labor markets, and there are always these famous numbers. We have a 12 percentage point gap in the employment rate between what we call third country nationals and nationals, and this gap reaches very high numbers in some countries like Belgium, where we are, the Netherlands, the other gap is between 20, 25 and 30 percent. And in my own country, the gap is well over 15 percent. So this is, a, and by the way, also in France and Germany. So we have a huge gap in participation in employment as such. And moreover, we also find that partially because of this gap in employment, but 
also because of what the title of this seminar articulates, because of, of joblessness and little progress in, in job career. Migrants are very much affected by poverty. Of course, poverty is, an <clears throat> is not an individual number. Poverty is a number which relates to a household. So this is not about the, individ the individual migrant. This is about the household in which the migrant lives. And of course, poverty can also be influenced by the size of the household, by the numbers of children, and many other things. But we know that poverty is not exclusively, but to a certain extent, driven by earned income through work. And we find that poverty rates of households with <coughs> non-EU mig migrants have a poverty rate which is higher than, is twice as high and higher than the poverty rate we have for EU nationals. So we have a, also a serious social issue. We also like to speak about social exclusion and we see poverty as an indicator for social exclusion. So in a way we could say that almost half of the households in which migrants live are not fully participating or at the risk of being excluded in our societies. This, of course, is not a very good result and very unsatisfactory. And the way to address it is, of course, not exclusively through labor market action, but labor market action is very important. Uh, let me add that there is a third aspect, again, very much related to today's topic, but I save you with, from the numbers. The, what we find is that third country, third country nationals working, now only those who work actually, are not using the skills and competences and education they have acquired well. They have a, there's another gap, we always like to use gaps, there's a gap in overqualification, which is very substantial. And that of course is not good, this is neither good for them because as we know from our friends from OECD, skills that one not uses, one loses. So of course if you work for a long time, again it's not a question of one year, but if you work for a long time in a job which doesn't demand to use the skills and competences you have acquired in your home country, in education, wherever, one tends to lose them. This is bad for the for the person, but it's of course also economically not very rational to have people who could do much more qualified, higher productive jobs, uh, like uh, seeing them doing jobs for which are below their qualification level. So we have some, by the way, interesting results in the study, I understand, that actually those do better who have obtained their qualifications in EU countries who know the language, of course, yeah? and who are also sort of uh, have access to some extent to active labor market programs in the countries. And I would like to say here very clearly that the European Social Fund, of course, can be used for helping anybody who has problems in the European labor market, who needs support and, and help. Job seekers, unemployed, of course, have equally access whether they are nationals, EU nationals or third country nationals if they live legally in the country. So this is of course not a reason not to use the ESF or otherwise active labor market policies. Uh, I would like to conclude just with two points I find particularly useful in the project but well, let's say also the recommendations the project gives. And there is one finding which I find a bit disturbing, but I'm sure today I will learn more about it than I can just understand from the summary. Uh, I think the first finding that one needs to look at country-specific situation and that the concrete situation of the migrant and his or her family of course, it depends whether one comes in as a high-skilled migrant with 
a company or whether one comes in as a child or spouse of a migrant who is already here or whether one comes in as a, as a massive uh, crisis at home. I mean, these are very different ways into the country and of course they pose very different challenges for the person to get into the labor market. But another finding I found a bit disturbing is that, first of all, the resources devoted to integration measures have declined. And I'm sure you will explain better or more clearly what this means. But you also indicated perhaps the efficiency was not enormously great on the money spent. So the question is maybe the resources declined rightly because they were the money was badly spent, or should we maybe spend the money for something else or differently? I mean, it's an important policy question. Of course, it's to a certain extent not only a question for the EU, it's a question for member states who probably spend more on this than the EU, certainly spend more on this than the EU. But it's an important policy hint to, to, to have such a, such a finding. With that, I would like to conclude. I'm very happy to see you all here, and I'm happy to, to say to all of you, welcome in the name of the European Commission, and I'm looking forward to an interesting seminar. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Georg, for, for this uh, inspiring introduction. And uh, good morning to all. A warm welcome also from my side. Uh, my name is, is Claire Cote, and I'm the director of the ILO, uh, the International Labour Organization, here uh, in Brussels. Um, so I'm very pleased to share this, to, to chair this first uh, session. Um, the title of our session this morning is Bleak picture of steady progress, labor market outcomes of new arrivals in Europe. So in this session, really what we want to do is to get a better and a deeper understanding of migrants' trajectory in the labor market after their arrivals in Europe. And in particular, as has been mentioned uh, by the previous speaker, we want to look at how fast migrants can actually get onto the labor market and under what conditions and what type of job do they, do they get? And if there is any progression in their trajectory on the labor market, in other words, can they move from low-skilled work up to higher-skilled work? Uh, so that's a bit the question we want to address uh, during that uh, session. There will be other sessions afterwards, as you can see from the agenda, where other issues would be uh, addressed. But in order to, uh, to, to, to increase our understanding of the facts, I've got four speakers with me here, great speakers, um, that would uh, address uh, those issues from their perspective. The first, the first speaker is going to be Madeleine Sumption here on the extreme right. Madeleine works actually for the uh, Migration Policy Institute, and she's going to tell us about the results of the, this two-year project, which has been uh, quite a lot of, of work and intense. Then uh, Mr. David Metcalf, who is a member of the um, Mi Migration Advisory Committee in the UK on my left. And David is going to tell us about the UK experience, basically. Then Mr. Thomas uh, Leibtisch of the OECD on the extreme uh, left. Uh, Thomas is going to tell us about the labor market integration here, the labor market integration uh, in the OECD countries. And then here on my right, Maya Hélène Amiel from the French Ministry of Interior, and she's going to tell us about her experience in her country, France. So I'm going to kindly ask the speaker to make some uh, brief introductory remarks, no more than 10 minutes. And I'm, I'm sorry, I have to apologize in advance. We're going to be strict on time because we want to engage with you. Uh, so it's 10 minutes for each speaker. And then after the, each speaker has spoken, I will open up the floor, but just for technical question, clarification question. If there is something you didn't understand on the presentation, on the project, then we will have a time to address those questions, but not the debate. The debate will, will take place after uh, the four presentation, if that's okay with you. 
So that's my proposal for today. So if it, everybody's fine with that, I think we can uh, start with our first uh, speaker, with uh, Madeleine. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming to uh, hear the results of, of our project. Um, what I'm going to do, because um, Claire's going to be very strict on time, uh, so I'm not going to give you a comprehensive overview of all the findings of our project, which, in any case, you can, um, you can find in the reports and on your chairs. Um, I'm going to just start the discussion with some of our uh, general findings on how easily immigrants um, have found jobs after they arrive in the labor market and the extent to which they've been able to progress out of the lowest skilled paid jobs, uh, in lowest skilled and lowest paid jobs into middle skilled and higher skilled work over time. Um, and I, I'm going to focus primarily on some of the, the macro differences between countries in, in our study. We looked at France, Germany, Sweden, the UK, Spain, and the Czech Republic. Um, and then I know that some of my uh, co-panelists are going to talk a little bit more about some of the individual drivers of, uh, of integration outcomes and the barriers that people have faced to upward, upward mobility in specific countries. Um, I'll also just say a little bit about our initial the policy considerations and then my colleague Megan Benton is going to follow up with a lot more detail on that in the second, in the second panel. Now, um, as, as is well known, the integration outcomes of newly arriving immigrants in a, a, in the EU vary quite significantly across, um, across different countries. Um, and one of the interesting things that I think our data clearly suggests is that the variation in outcomes among countries um, is, is primarily in their access to employment, especially initially. There was somewhat less variation in the, from the data that we, um, that we gathered in the project in the extent to which people are able to progress out of the lower skilled jobs. Into, um, into more skilled work, which for the most part was, um, was relatively limited. Now, um, this uh, first slide I have, uh, this shows the employment rates of a single cohort of immigrants. So these are people who arrived between 2001 and 2003, and it tracks their, um, their employment rates in the first eight years after they arrive. Um, and I think, you know, kind of, general summary that one could take from this, this chart is that in, in some countries, access to employ, employment initially is really not the major integration issue for, for immigrants. Um, in the, so the UK, Czech Republic, and Spain, which are the countries on the right, um, have relatively high employment rates, even initially, and th those are rates that are roughly similar to, to native workers in the same countries. On the other hand, um, there are uh, other countries here, we have uh, France, Germany, and Sweden, where only a minority of immigrants are employed um, after, within two years after arriving in the country. Now, they do also experience some um, significant improvement in the employment rates, um, but it's not quite enough to catch up with most of the countries um, on the right-hand side, the exception, of course, being Spain, where you see a decrease in employment um, largely due to the economic crisis. Um, and it's also not enough progress to catch up with native workers in, in the same country. Now, the, the reasons for this variation are quite, um, are quite complex, and it's, it's notoriously a treacherous exercise to try and explain uh, macro differences between countries, because there's so much going on that could potentially um, explain, explain the, the results. Um, we, we, do, we discuss a number of, of possible explanations in our study um, Obviously, a major one is the composition of, of immigrant flows and the ways that they differ between, between countries um, in terms of the skill levels and the language abilities. Um, also, the, um, there are the, the profile of um, labor migration as opposed to other types of immigration varies across the countries in our study. So the, the, ones, the countries with higher rates of employment also tend to be the ones that, um, that have a greater share of labor-motivated immigration, both in their um, non-EU immigration and also among their mobile EU citizens. Um, there are also some uh, possible explanations in the structure of the labor markets in which immigrants operate. Um, so uh, the UK notably has a, a less regulated labor market than, um, than the other countries in the study and that is thought uh, to facilitate employment for, um, for the types of people that employers might otherwise be reluctant to hire. Now, the, uh, if you look at the Czech Republic and Spain as well, they have more labor market regulation, but it's not always, um, 
strictly enforced, the compliance isn't that high, and there are significant informal economies which may also have facilitated a, a higher initial rate of employment. And then by contrast, in, in the countries that have, um, that have lower initial employment rates among immigrants, uh, you see either um, some kind of more formal regulation, so in uh, the case of Sweden and France, uh, you see both collective bargaining or more hiring and firing restrictions, respectively, uh, or also informal, and bar informal barriers, um, particularly to upward mobility of the kind that you see in Germany, where there are somewhat higher expectations among employers as to the, the types of qual formal qualifications that an individual will have in order to be able to, to access middle skill jobs. So those are some of the potential kind of broader structural reasons um, that, uh, that we may see those differences. Overall, though, I think when looking at the, the employment rates, it's fair to say that in, in many countries, employment is initially um, quite positive, and in other countries, while it, it takes some time, it does get there um, eventually. The, hmm. sorry, my uh, booming, echoey voice. <laughs> I did ask for it specifically to give me more gravitas. Um, the, um, so the, the, the results are quite different when we look at the, the skill level of the job that, uh, that people have. And here, I think the evidence of progression is somewhat less clear. So um, there is, in most of the countries, uh, with the notable exception of Spain, there is relatively little reduction in the share of immigrants who are doing the least skilled jobs. So this shows the same type of analysis, a single cohort of immigrants over the first eight years, um, except that it shows the, the proportion of people who are employed who are employed in the least skilled work. Um, Spain, of course, did see a significant reduction, but it's from a, a very high, high base, so not enough to catch up with, uh, with the other countries. A, a technical note here, which we go into in some detail in the report, is that this metric that we use may understate the progress out of the lower skilled jobs, um, and you, you get a more pic positive picture if you look at the share of the population rather than the share of employment. Uh, that's moving into to middle and high skilled jobs for, for various reasons that, that we could discuss if people are interested. But overall, um, regardless of those differences, it's, it remains the case that um, the immigrants, even after a, up to a decade in the country, are heavily rep overrepresented in low skilled work, um, and uh, particularly compared to native workers in, in the countries where they, uh, where they live. So our report also includes a lot of detail on subgroups that I'm not going to go into. One thing worth mentioning briefly is that um, this overrepresentation in, um, uh, in low-skilled jobs is, n is only partially explained by lower education, lower levels of formal education, and only in some countries. In the UK and Spain in particular, immigrants have higher or, or somewhat similar um, uh, levels of education to native workers. Um, a second observation worth making is that um, there's a, a significant variation by, um, in immigrants' outcomes depending on the countries or regions of, of origin. And so we, uh, the immigrant groups that we looked at have relatively distinct integration needs. On the one hand, um, we have, there are some groups of immigrants who do just fine. Um, so they have high levels of employment and they tend to work in, in high skill jobs. And those tend to be people from wealthy countries of origin like the EU15 or OECD countries. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, there are, there are people who struggle on, on both fronts. So they have difficulties getting into the labor market and um, they also tend to be overrepresented in, in low skilled jobs and often in those categories, just to generalize, you tend to see um, refugees or particular disadvantaged minorities that, uh, that differ by country. Um, then that there's another rather different group of people who, um, who have found access to work relatively easy, but they, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily able to progress out of low skilled jobs even uh, into, um, into higher skilled, middle and higher skilled work in some cases even despite relatively high levels of, of education. And then a fourth category, which is actually less common, but we include it just for the sake of completeness, is people who um, are not necessarily working, but if they do work, then they tend to be in high skilled um, jobs. And one example of that was um, EU15 immigrants in Spain, um, and, uh, and particularly EU15 women who move, uh, who move within, within the European Union.
So let me just uh, finish up by um, saying something about the implications that this diversity has for, uh, for policy. Um, obviously, um, the, the caveat to all of this comparative research is that the, the structure of integration policies varies a lot between European countries. Um, from you know, one, hand of the spec one end of the spectrum, you have countries with organized introduction programs or significant um, voluntary or mandatory um, training programs for immigrants. And then on the other hand, there are countries that have much more um, ad hoc policies, sometimes organized at the regional or city level, uh, sometimes driven primarily by, by nonprofits. But regardless of those, those differences, one common theme that emerged was that with um, with the possible exception of, of Germany, and perhaps you could make an argument for Sweden, uh, immigrants' progression from low-skilled to middle-skilled or high-skilled jobs um, was, was not generally the highest policy priority. Um, there are a number of good programs that we identified that are specifically focused at trying to um, improve immigrants' upward mobility but um, they tended to be small scale and often lacking in resources or lacking in, uh, in systemic reach to large numbers of, of people. Um, another uh, factor in the lack of uh, progression as a policy priority was that the providers of, of services to immigrants, um, for example, employment advisory services, um, often tended to have incentives to get people into work in the short term, but not necessarily worry about the quality of that work in, uh, in the long term. And many of them had relatively limited capacity to offer uh, career advice that's, that's focused on, on long-term outcomes. Although some countries have, have been innovating to try and uh, address this, uh, these incentive problems, particularly Sweden and to some extent the UK. Um, a second, uh, second observation is that most countries um, still don't seem to be tapping the, the real potential of their mainstream institutions like public employment services. Uh, these, at least in theory, these are organizations with much larger resources at their disposal than the types of targeted programs specifically for, for immigrants. Um, so they, do, they have the potential for, for a broader reach and uh, to be more inclusive, to not have some of the same problems of, um, of focusing on narrowly on specific target groups that allow some people to fall through the cracks. Um, However, uh, across most of the countries that we, that we studied, there was a concern that, um, that the providers, and particularly employment advisors, didn't necessarily understand how best to serve immigrants. So they didn't necessarily have knowledge of the specific types of barriers that, uh, that immigrants can face, um, or of the specialized services that may in many cases be, be available to them. Um, and some countries, of course, have, have tried to resolve this by improving training for advisors in public employment services or, trying to, or mechanisms, networking mechanisms to improve the flow of information about what's, what's available. And then the final point that I will make, um, and I think that is quite important, for, particularly if we're interested in upward mobility rather than just access to employment, is that um, many of the, the standard integration services, the things that we think about when um, when people talk about integration policies like introduction programs or specific training programs for, for immigrants, um, tend not to reach the majority of people who are already in work. Um, so that these are long-term residents who um, are not, because they have jobs, they're not necessarily coming into contact with public employment services or introduction programs or any of those other services that, that are commonly discussed. And so I think uh, one of the big challenges that we look at in the report is um, is how to improve the skills and also, crucially, the, the promotion opportunities for people who, who already have jobs. So this will be looking at how to create better pathways for progression on the job, um, how to make it easier for employers to, to promote people who, who gain new skills, or how to um, improve, make, introduce more cost-effective ways for people to access services or, or training. Um, despite the fact that they have busy work schedules and, and are employed full time. And we're going to talk a lot more about that in the, in the next panel. So I will, uh, I will leave it there and pass it along to, um, to my co-panelists to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Madeleine. I think it was not easy to sum up a two-year project in 10 minutes, so I think you did a great job. Um, I'm not going to try to sum up this, of course, but if you have any question, clarification question, technical question on, on, the, on the project itself or on the results, that's the time. Oh, you do? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you very much uh, for an interesting presentation. 
I have uh, one technical question regarding the calculation of your longitudinal follow-up, which you, which, you, which you said you're doing. I was not aware that for most of these countries, except Sweden, there were longitudinal data that would allow one to follow the same migrants over time, over eight years. Is it, as I suspect, like repeated cross-sections you've taken? Uh, and how do you deal then with the issue like of very small groups when you have just one or two years? So it's basically people claiming that they've arrived one or two years ago, and then uh, two years later they have claimed to arrive, arrive three or four years ago. And then you assume that it's basically the same cohort. And, um, and how do you deal with the issue of very small sample sizes with respect, like for example, in the Czech Republic, the migrants you're talking about, one or two years, you probably have just a dozen in the, in the labor force survey? Um, yes, yeah, this is a synthetic cohort analysis. So we don't, we don't have longitudinal data. We, um, we follow a single cohort of people, and then we assume that on average, these are the same people um, who arrived in a given year that you follow up with uh, a few years later. Um, there are a couple of problems with that. Um, return migration is one, so that the composition of the cohort may change um, over time. Um, and sample size is another. Um, for the most part, um, so we, we only, we break down the groups to the extent that the sample size permits, and the biggest problem with that was the Czech Republic. So with the Czech Republic, we were able to look at, um, at just the kind of uh, larger samples of, of the entire immigrant population, whereas for some of the others, we were able to go into much more detail about you know, specific educational groups. But yes, that was um, the biggest limitation that we faced in the study. Yes? Looking at the, uh, at the first two graphs that you presented, um, I was a little bit puzzled with the decline in Spain. And I wonder to what extent this decline is due to the economic crisis and uh, how we can dissociate the effects of integration, the genuine effects, the ceteris paribus effects, let's say, from uh, the trend of, of the economic. Because Mm. I suppose, I imagine, that if we were taking as, as a starting point, not 2001, 2003, so that we enter in the economic crisis, but we, we take as a start point 95, for instance, perhaps the results would be quite different. Um, yes, they would. I think that, that the decline in Spain, um, I, I think it's probably entirely due to the crisis. And in the, the Spanish um, country report, we do look at other cohorts and find that, um, that the trajectory is, is up until everyone hits the crisis and, and then it starts to, to decline again. I think there was another, yes, please. Thank you. Um, I have a question actually on the role of um, institutions. Um, I think the study is very interesting um, and I was wondering actually if you also had a look at the role of minimum income schemes uh, in the transitions from welfare to work, because this might be the institution where um, newly arriving immigrants uh, or at. So I was just wondering if this was treated in also in the study. Um, no, we didn't look in specific detail about that. So we lumped together all of um, the institutional factors into one, and I think you know that would that would come under the category of factors that could potentially discourage um, employment of, of new arrivals um, because it, it creates less flexibility for employers to take a risk on, uh, on a newcomer who might not have the traditional profile of, uh, of someone that, okay. you, that they would usually hire. Okay, we might come back to that in the, in the second part of the discussion though. Uh, well, now I think I'm going to turn to David. David uh, is going to tell us about uh, the UK, the experience in the UK. And as you know, migration has been quite high on the UK agenda, so we're really looking forward to listening to you, David. <laughs> My speciality. Oh, okay. Um, thanks very much. I'm uh, slightly here by false pretenses, I think, because we, we didn't do any work for any of the organisations. The Migration Advisory Committee basically advises the British government on issues that it requests help on. Um, we don't sort of go off and d do things just, just on our own. But over the last two years, 
Uh, so uh, we've done a major report published a little while ago on low-skilled immigration. The focus of the research was low -skilled, the impact of low-skilled immigration on the British labour market, as it were. But Madeleine asked me, well, is there anything that you could say by implication about, about the, the uh, impact on migrants? My initial reaction was, no, there isn't. But then when I thought about it and I sort of went back and read the report, I think, oh, actually, actually yes, there's quite a lot that we can, that we can uh, point to. So that's, that's what I'm uh, going to attempt to do. And again, I'll do it very briefly. The, the, um, the uh, main report is there on the uh, website. Um, OK, just start with some facts. Um, according to our uh, uh, Office of National Statistics, uh, low-skilled jobs account for uh, almost half, 45% of total employment, and migrants account for 16% of these jobs. Uh, although the there's a big debate, of course, about EU immigration, that if we're thinking about the stock, the stock is actually 60-40 non-EU EU, uh, reflecting the large number of migrants, perhaps from the Indian subcontinent, uh, who came uh, prior to uh, around 2003. Um, you can see that the migrant share has increased substantially uh, in both low and high skilled occupations and of course this is one reason for the attention which is presently being given to immigration, the, the very rapid rise in the, the stock uh, of migrants. But in particular there's a, um, a major increase you'll see in the absolute number of high, high school jobs as defined by our Office for National Statistics. So our focus was uh, on British residents, but you can invert it, which is what I'm going to try to do. So let's, let's take some uh, positive findings, really the migrants. Um, first of all, there's a large number of extra skilled jobs. I mean, the labor market is changing a lot, and I'll, I'll come back to this, because there's also a negative element to this as well for migrants. Um, and so some, some of these jobs, it will be taken by migrants, perhaps from the EUA, but some will progress. Um, the objective evidence and employer attitudes, and as, as Madeleine has suggested, uh, on average migrants are better educated. Um, employers, uh, uh, in, our, in our very detailed case studies, I mean, we went to so many different uh, uh, workplaces, sectors, um, are adamant that, in, that the, many of the migrants have got better soft skills, that, like these issues, certainly better work ethic, they're prepared to t turn up at six in the morning to make sandwiches, whereas British workers are not, and they're prepared to be much more mobile. And given that we have got, as uh, uh, Madeline said, a, a, a flexible labour market, that's actually that's quite an, an important uh, issue. We've also seen uh, progress to supervisory roles. I mean, in particularly if you take, for example, horticulture, where you get uh, the usual system is migrants coming for six, for six months or so and then going back to Romania or uh, Bulgaria, Poland, the, the return migrants are, are the ones who take the supervisory roles. So the, the, there's definitely good, good progression and presumably that will be um, replicated in other places. Since doing this, these slides, a, a, a very interesting study came out last week, which is, is uh, in effect, a longitudinal study. And it, the question is, um, do you escape from low pay? I, I won't go into all the details about how you define escape and ha how you define low pay. I mean, I, I, I'll, talk, I'll talk about them if people want in discussion. I won't, I won't for a second. And the... And the, the among the really important uh, fragments of uh, the results, first of all, you're more likely to escape from low pay if you are not born in the UK, if you've got, and if you've got a degree, if you've got a positive attitude. Okay? Well, all of those factors are associated with immigration. You're less likely to escape if you're disabled, I mean, not surprisingly, a single parent, living in local authority rented housing, being older, being part-time. All of those are not associated with immigrants. So in some senses, what, although this study, the focus was not about immigrants escaping from low pay, but the study does, does suggest that um, quite, a, quite a large number, by implication, quite a large number of immigrants are indeed escaping from uh, low pay. So, so there's some positive signs, um, but there's also, alas, some negative signs. Now, 
this, this is a, um, a, a very important issue, but it may be that some people here would wish to sort of argue the opposite, I mean quite legitimately, that the fact that we don't seem to enforce minimum standards might actually be good for initial employment of migrants. Okay? It's a flexible labour market, as, as we saw in the slide just now, the migrants can easily get jobs. Okay? But, but I mean, our concern was in some senses British residents, but also what was going on with the migrants. And there is, there's clear evidence that although we have got an, a, a, a labour market where it's quite easy to hire, quite easy to fire people, we have also, we're supposed to have some minimum standards. And those minimum standards are not being properly enforced. So I, I, I list some here. Um, there's the, the inspection regime to do with the national minimum wage. Uh, while, while the people who do the inspections do their best, they just haven't got enough resources. And you can see, I've, I've calculated these. You, can, you get a visit once every 250 years, and you get prosecuted once in a million years. Well, that's not exactly an incentive to, to um, abide by the national minimum wage. And there's clear evidence of uh, some British, but of, of ethnic workers and uh, Eastern European workers, Chinese and Indian, I was thinking, uh, in restaurants, for example, but also Eastern European workers, being, there's clear evidence of exploitation there. We've also got a, 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 an authority which monitors gang masters, people who supply labour, um, and I, I, they again do a very good job, but it seems to me there's a case for extending this authority into other areas, uh, for example, construction and probably hospitality. And again, whenever they, uh, make a, whenever they take a prosecution, uh, the courts seem to impose trivial penalties. So again, there's, it's, it's, the incentive to comply is not, is not as good as it should be. There's also concerns over health, uh, health and safety, particularly uh, houses of multiple occupation. I mean, this is, this is a, a major concern where you have a house which has got, uh, you know, maybe, maybe 20 migrants in it, you know, sometimes hot bedding, as it were, you know, half of them asleep in the daytime, half of them asleep at night time. Um, and uh, given that we now have got, uh, in the private sector, de we're de facto non-union. I mean, we've got very little collective bargaining in the private sector, very trivial levels of unionization in the private sector. I think that, that the, the erosion of the enforcement mechanism is very important. But I repeat, you, c you can argue the opposite, at least initially, in terms of the migrants getting jobs. So that's the first uh, negative. Second p potential negative is this, is this change which uh, the, the American labor market to some extent, and certainly the British labor market, I'm not familiar with whether the same thing is going on in Europe. It's what in, in the UK we refer to as the hollowing out. So you, you look at the distribution of jobs on the basis of the wages, but the wages at the, the initial point in time. And what you see is that since, since uh, the turn of the century, there's been quite a rapid growth in high wage occupations quite a rapid growth in uh, the low-wage occupations, but the middle occupations, in clerical and manufacturing in particular, are in substantial decline. Um, and it may be that they would traditionally have been the areas that the migrants would have progressed up from the low-skilled up through the middle-skilled, but that hollowing out of the labour market means that the, the uh, numbers, the absolute numbers of these jobs are lower than they previously were. And then a, th a third potential negative, although it requires a bit of thought, is that the migrants are very concentrated. If, if you look at the numbers between the two censuses, 10 years between the censuses, the, new, the, the uh, population of England and Wales that was non-UK born grew by almost three million, but three quarters of it was in just one quarter of local authorities. And therefore, those local authorities, um, they, they need extra resources to ease the transition. So this is not directly a labor market issue, but it, it, it feeds into the labor market. And I mean, these resources would, would include things like English language provision, uh, enforcement of uh, housing regulations, proper provision of education and health facilities. And again, uh, in, in our report, we go into this in detail, but we don't think that the uh, the local authorities that bear the brunt of the immigration are getting the resources that they presently require. I've got one final slide, but I don't really need to go into this. It, it, people can read it, as they say, in the uh, privacy of your own homes if you want to do. Um, 
Uh, it's really just emphasizing, I think, the, the uh, point that Thomas was making. There, many researchers make do with a second best method of uh, investigation, namely successive cross-sections to look at immigration. But the ideal way of doing it is to have a panel uh, where you follow the same people over time, okay, migrants and non-migrants, and then look at their, look at their experience. M many countries will not have such panels. As it happens, we now have got one, um, but it, 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 there's, there are sensitive issues about uh, the release of this data, but as and when it gets released and researchers get to it, it'll be a very, very valuable uh, use of, it, it'll be very valuable for researchers and, and for policy, and by implication then for policy, uh, in, into the future. Good. Thank you, David. Uh, so the same, the same type of question, clarification question, technical question. Doesn't seem to be the case. So, uh, so we move to our third speaker, who is uh, Thomas from the OECD. And Thomas is going to tell us about the work the OECD is doing on integration policy. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to present our work. Um, some of the key findings on, um, on the labor market integration of uh, new arrivals that we have distilled from our, in particular from our country studies, Jobs for Immigrants. Uh, we have done uh, 12 country studies uh, over the last uh, 10 years, and I'm trying to summarize those findings in 10 minutes. Um, so, First of all, if we stand back a little bit, I mean, there's an increasing focus, as we see also from this conference here and from the, from the topic, uh, increasing focus on your, your rivals. Why is that the case? Um, why, don't not, why don't we care about all those many migrants who have been in the country for so many years, which is the bulk of the migrant population? Well, clearly there's the observation that the integration outcomes of these past migrant cohorts and their children have not always been fully satisfactory. Um, and clearly there's a lot of evidence of that. Uh, also, the reasons for that are not fully clear. Some has clearly to do with the skills of migrants. Um, there may also be, have been an inadequate uh, offering of integration services in the past, or as has some often the presumption that immigrants do not really want to integrate, um, willingness to integrate. Um, and when we, when we look at the policies that, that get developed in Europe, um, particularly on the non-labor side, then you see more and more that integration is seen as an obligation by the migrant whereas in the OECD settlement countries, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, um, but also in the United States, integration seems as something that immigrants want to do naturally. And um, so it's quite interesting when you look at these introduction programs that have been developed in a lot of European countries, they're not always focused at the labor market integration aspects, even though everybody will probably agree that this is the single most important thing that you need to get right if you want to integrate immigrants well into the societies in the long run. So there's a certain paradox here. And um, when we look at this issue of labor market integration of new arrivals, we must start from the fact that new immigrants arrive in their host countries in a context, um, uh, they have acquired their skills in a context that differs quite a lot in terms of working conditions, in terms of educational context, and many other things um, from that of the host countries. So first of all, what you need to do is to take stock of the skills of migrants that they already bring with them, and that's quite often not done. A second point is then, based from that stock-taking exercise, you make a bilan, uh, and look where, which skills uh, are still needed to be developed. And there's also the issue of activating unused skills, particularly for, for family migrants and for refugees. And last but not least, the transversal issue, uh, transmitting the information about migrant skills um, to employers. And that's a key challenge. How do you transmit that knowledge? Um, just a very broad picture here, and what you, what you see is that in most countries, clearly, a longer duration in the host country is associated with better outcomes. Um, you see uh, two countries where, where the differences between all migrants and recent migrants are not very strong in this respect. And that's interesting, it's Norway and Denmark, and we could talk a lot about these two countries in particular, because there's two factors that, that explain that. First of all, they have a better mix of new arrivals with respect to the past, but also very strong labor market integration policy focused on rapid integration of uh, new arrivals. And it's very hard to disentangle the effects of the two. Um, 
Nevertheless, what you see um, is very clearly that this mix of the migrant population is probably the single most important factor in explaining the differences and outcomes that you see across countries. Clearly, a country like Sweden, which we saw here at the bottom of the scale, has a lot of humanitarian migrants. The humanitarian migration and their family migration, Tommy, you know this. Um, and uh, and um, it's clearly the differences are very different from a country that has mainly labor migration and a lot of free mobility migration. But you nevertheless see that the refugees integrate quite rapidly into the labor market, starting from a low, from a very low employment rate. But there's good, significant progress. For family migrants, it's already not as well. We have here the example of Norway, um, and but we could have that with many other countries as well. Um, and uh, the, labor mi the labor migrants, well, in fact, if you, if you arrive as a job offer, then your labor market integration, at least in terms of employment rate, can only decline over time. It cannot increase anymore. Here we have uh, labor migrants and their families, so there's actually a slight increase because of the employment of the family migrants. And this composition of the different migrant intake, you also see that with respect to the progress that you see of cohorts over time. We have done here a similar exercise than what we've seen early on, except that we have taken five years, we have taken five years of residence, uh, and then followed these people uh, five years later, because there's a lot of white noise in those data. I mean, like, you, you find quite often that people who claim to have arrived three to four years before are actually much more numerous than the people who claim to have arrived one or two years before uh, when you look at the data two years earlier. And so they have a little bit less noise, less wider, white noise. We did, um, we, we kind of aggregated over five years of residence, and then you see the following. Well, clearly, this is basically the pre-crisis cohort, and we look at the employment rates at the, in the uh, post, in the, well, in the current uh, period. And you see very strong declines, though there's no convergence with respect to high employment rates, there's a decline in employment rates in the countries that were hard hit by the crisis. On the other hand, you have a fairly significant improvement uh, in countries like uh, France, Germany, Austria, uh, but even Australia in terms of employment rates um, because also of better economic conditions um, and in most of these and also um, because they have a different mix of migrants with a lot of family migrants who then integrate into the labor market. That even accounts for Australia, only one quarter of the migrant intake in Australia um, are labor migrants. And we should not forget, when we talk about the labor market integration of uh, recent arrivals, we should not forget uh, the many migrants that are already in the country and including their children. And we see here that even for, the, for that group, even for those who are high educated, for those children of migrants who are high educated, we see quite significant gaps in terms of employment rates. This is a result of a, a past work that we've done together with, with DG Employment on the children of migrants. And clearly, this points to more structural issues that are not related to this kind of you acquire skills while you're in the country and this natural uh, convergence process. Clearly, there's something to be dealt with parental background characteristics. There's something also an issue of networks, knowledge about labor market functions. How do I sell myself in a job interview? How do I write a CV? Where do I find those jobs? How do I approach an employer? And last but not least, uh, the issue of, issue of discrimination. Some of the good practice that we have to build to facilitate a rapid labor market integration of new arrivals, clearly very key is to link language training with work experience. That's quite costly, but that's the most effective way to get people into, not only to the labor market, but also to get them lastingly uh, integrated into good jobs. But that also requires, of course, that the language training needs to be adapted to those needs of the labor market and to immigrants' competence levels. As also, we see a lot of focus on foreign credential recognition right now in a lot of countries. Traditionally, that's been uh, a key concern for countries like Australia and Canada, New Zealand also, but also new European countries look into this much more closely. Um, Austria, Germany, the Netherlands, but I could add on to that list Sweden, for example, where there's been a lot of effort uh, into this. And also, very key is all integration at the end of the day is local. And quite often you have, a distinct, you have different tasks. The public employment service um, is organized at the national level, whereas social assistance um, is paid at the local level. Um, so you, you want to you wanna get the coordination between these actors um, well done and to be sure that the people are not shifted from one agency to the next, that they cooperate well. And clearly that incentives for municipalities, particularly when the 
um, when the national level takes care of the payments uh, over the first, first few years, the incentives for municipalities, for municipalities to get the immigrants uh, rapidly integrated should be uh, important to get very strong. And Denmark and Norway, but particularly Denmark, had a very strong policies in this respect, and that seems to have, uh, have had good impact. Uh, interesting also Norway, for example, they target introduction programs, particularly at those lacking basic skills. Working with the social partners, I think here Belgium provides really a very good example of how you can do that in terms of the diversity policies that have been developed here, working with the companies and working also with the trade unions. And last but not least, mentorship, a very important issue, not necessarily costly, but very key to get those kind of soft skills to find employment um, for new arrivals, um, which, which I tend to lack, and to get them the networks. And here, particularly Denmark and France have some very interesting initiatives. Well, and last but not least, what are the new challenges? Well, first of all, there's clearly an increasing heterogeneity of migration flows with respect to what we've seen in the past. It's in terms of migration categories, um, labor, family, free mobility, and now again, increasing humanitarian migration, but also skills levels within these categories. And that clearly requires much more tailor-made approaches uh, than what we have seen uh, in the past. A key group that often tends to be a bit neglected are the migrants who lack basic skills. But it's a very important and tough group for migration, for integration policies. Because generally, you do not manage to get these people into the labor market, not even in two or three years. You need to invest over five to seven years to get them integrated. And then the question is when you have limited resources, as most countries have right now, should you make that investment? Particularly when the payoff is not immediate. But it will transcend, of course, to the children of these migrants, so it, may necessary, so it may nevertheless be necessary. In southern Europe, here clearly a key issue is that many low-skilled labor migrants have arrived prior to the crisis. So this raises the issue, of course, what do we do with these migrants now that their jobs have gone away? Um, what about long-term employability of these people when they do not speak Italian, Spanish, and so on? And it, also and it also means, particularly for those countries who face very severe budget pressures, where should you focus your efforts on? Um, clearly, you might want to focus on those who are in need and who are likely to going to be staying in the country. And that's not always easy to identify. Um, with respect to free mobility, it's a very particular challenge. But even with respect to uh, third country labor migration, it's quite difficult to say who's going to stay on and who, who may return to his or her origin country. But one group, and with that I would like to finish, that's clearly uh, going to be staying, uh, are the family migrants. And it's quite interesting when you look at this uh, across countries, you find a very, very consistent pattern. Family migrants are quite often out of the focus of labor market integration uh, policy. For, a single re for the main reason is that they do not depend on any benefits. Generally, the uh, um, prerequisite for family migration that you're able to join, particularly for family reunification type and family formation type, not accompanying family, is that the principal, app, that, the, that the sponsor who's already in the host country has sufficient means to take care of that person. So he or she is generally in employment, um, but the, the family migrant generally does not have any support in that respect because the contact with the authorities is precisely generally through the benefit system. And that's also where the enforcement mechanisms take place. So it's also very hard to enforce something if you, that's your concern. Um, but they are a key group, um, including, um, uh, including their children. Um, once again, I think that's a very important issue that's been often neglected when we talk about integration policies for new arrivals. And with that, I would like to finish. Um, if you're interested in more of our work on the Jobs for Immigrants uh, series and also the work that we have done jointly with the European Commission, uh, you're going to find more on our website. Thanks. And thanks, Thomas. I think your last slide about the challenges is going to be food for thought for the next uh, sessions as well, session two and session three. So thanks for enlarging the discussion. Is there any clarification question on Thomas' presentation? Yes, please. Um, when there are the comparisons between employment rates of the uh, the migrant population and the overall population, usually there are some breakdowns by educational level. I just wanted to know if in the OECD uh, you checked whether the age composition between the, the overall population and that of migrants could have an impact when we compare employment rates. Uh, 
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're, we're actually doing quite now a, a, a huge uh, project uh, together with, um, with, uh, with the European Commission on the indicators of immigrant integration where we also control for age, uh, age and education effects. Um, quite often it doesn't matter as much as you think. But it explains some of the very strange cases that you have. For example, when you look at the European, in the European countries, on the Eastern European, uh, Central and Eastern European countries, sometimes you get very strange results in terms of uh, changes over time and integration outcomes and very, very peculiar res results. That's quite often due to the fact that their migrant population are, qu are quite old. And if you control uh, in the Southern European countries, which have a very young uh, immigrant population, um, quite old because they're affected by, by border changes and, 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 other, uh, and other issues. Um, and, um, and when you look at the southern European countries, the picture gets actually much more bleaker when you control for age effects, not only with respect to employment rates, because young people generally have higher employment rates than older people, and most of the migrant population is, uh, is in the prime working age, um, but also, and that's a much greater concern in terms of education, um, because there's been, in all countries, a huge progress in educational attainment over time. And, um, and when you actually control for that, uh, then for some of the, European for some of the southern, European southern European countries in particular, the issue with respect to the educational attainment looks pretty, pretty bleak for new arrivals. Thank you for that. Any other? Yes, please. Thank you. I have a question for clarification regarding the Belgium as a good example of the work with social partners? Because actually you mentioned also um, the importance of social assistance which paid at local level and so on. So I think maybe the social partners are quite, quite well involved in um, uh, people on unemployment and on developing business plans in Belgium and so on. But for example, 70% of the people on social assistance in Belgium are immigrants and I haven't, I've been following for years minimum income scheme and I haven't seen any social partner really a lot involved in minimum income schemes for example or interested, they, they are not paying it but I, I wonder what is the, in, in which aspect that Belgium is such a good example with involving the social partners. I think we have moved a bit away from the mere technical yeah, discussion, yeah. but I will nevertheless very re briefly, re reply very briefly. Since we're in Belgium. First of all, um, yes. First of all, um, social assistance is a very specific uh, issue here in Belgium. It's, we've done some work on the fiscal impact of migration, and Belgium stands out as the country where immigrants are most strongly overrepresented among those who get social assistance. Um, that's not the case with respect to unemployment benefits, by the way, where they get much, where their overrepresentation is very limited compared to their overrepresentation among the unemployed meaning also that their access to the active labor market policy, which is often much more generous, I'm not so familiar with the specific situation in Belgium, but in most countries, it's much more generous for people who are unemployed, who are formerly unemployed um, under the public employment uh, scheme, uh, with respect to those who are under social assistance. So, um, so they get much, much less access to active labor market policy, and in fact, that's a major concern like, of all these people who are seeking employment, but under social assistance, they have much less access to this kind of expensive programs, particularly when we talk about upskilling that they would need. Um, and, and when you look at, uh, with respect to the social partners, um, um, I, I, well, the point is, the, um, the, the, the example which I was mentioning here is particularly the diversity um, policies that have been implemented in, in, in the Flemish part and also increasingly here in the, in the Brussels region. Um, and, and we really think that's a, that's a, good, uh, that's a good, uh, good example. Working with the employers, um, the employers' associations are paid by the public, uh, uh, public employment service uh, through uh, diversity consultants to work um, to show to the companies what their benefits would be to diversify their recruitment channels, what they can do to better promote uh, hiring and upskilling of migrants. And the trade unions, uh, they are, have been paid consultants um, to work with the fellow workers on the shop floor to increase the acceptance of these kind of workers, which is also sometimes also neglected. And we think that's a good policy. It's, it's been credibly implemented, and it's uh, perhaps not, uh, not as widespread as, um, as, uh, as everybody would, would like, but, uh, but we think it's a, it's a fairly, fairly significant initiative that merits to, to be spread more broadly, uh, including to other OECD countries. 
Yeah, thank you. So we're going to move from Belgium to French, and that's not very far away. <laughs> so uh, now um, we got our last speaker, Maya Hélène, who's going to present us a new study uh, in France on uh, concerning new arrivals. Maya Hélène. So thank you very much. Um, so just some introductions in the in France in each ministry you have a statistical service department and I'm, I am the head of this department for uh, immigration um, topics and it is uh, located in the Ministry of Interior um, so well uh, just a few words of to present what are new migrants in France. Some figures. Um, according to um, demographic statistics, you have about 300,000 people migrating in France each year. Uh, but what to, I have to stress at the beginning is that uh, it is both EU and non-EU uh, people, but uh, our policy uh, schemes are designed toward non-EU people. We have nothing for EU people. <laughs> so it can explain some differences with, for instance, the OECD diagnosis, because in the OECD uh, concepts, uh, migration is both uh, free movement and other um, motives of migration. So, um, according to OECD, we have 140,000 persons permanent, as permanent migrants each year. And among those people, uh, 100,000 are contracting a specific contract, which is the reception and integration contract. It is a, a device uh, which has been designed uh, to help people arriving in France in order to be well integrated. Of course, in the labor market, but for housing and so on. Um, this contract I will probably change in the next few years, uh, but for the moment it is still relevant. Um, so it concerns adults, of course, workers, family migrants, refugees, and a few other categories of migrants, but no students. And maybe, as you know, we have a, lo a lot of uh, students, uh, foreign students in France. So, some figures about the migration in France. Two out of three are fam family migrants. Uh, a little more women than men. Uh, and the, the age, the median age is 32 year old, and women are younger than men, but women are also more represented among family migrants. And it will explain some um, specific problems later in my speech. Uh, arrival in France, it is not getting a permit. It is not at the same time. Um, Three uh, new migrants out of five have arrived uh, from less than two years, but we can find in our contractors people arrived 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, well, um, it explains a lot, of course, of uh, what they have done before was not legal, of course, but we have to take it into account in order to assess integration. It's not the same as people just arrived. 
The origins are African, uh, it is Maghreb and other African countries, and Asia, uh, that is to say, uh, Turkey and China. Well, um, we have a specific statistical survey. Um, it exists also in Can this type of survey exists also in Canada and New Zealand. And it has been launched by Ministry of Interior with the support of uh, European Union funds. Uh, it's called ELIPA in French, but it is a longitudinal survey with three waves of interviews uh, about integration of new migrants. And the scope is people who have signed a contract, a reception contract in 2009. Uh, the sample is um, 15,000, and we have a quite a satisfactory uh, answering rate, as you may see. Um, the, the interviews were in 14 languages. It's a main difference compared to, for instance, labor force survey. In France, it is only in French. Here, we can um, catch uh, more um, specific population, if you want, because they don't speak French. Uh, for instance, uh, Chinese or Tur Tur Turkish people. Um, this survey, uh, as um, in the questionnaire, you have, of, co of course, uh, demographics, um, uh, reasons of migration, labor market issues, uh, credential skills, and so on. We have a, s a sort of module about French language, which is linked to, to a French literacy survey which is called IVQ. Um, unfortunately, it's not linked to the OECD survey because it was uh, too heavy to, <laughs> to do it because the OECD survey is very, very interesting, but uh, it's um, very costly. So it was not possible to include a module from it in our survey housing, social inclusion, and so on. Uh, if you need some more information and the complete results, the first results, uh, there are um, booklets in English and French at the entrance. So what we can observe concerning, with respect, sorry, to employment rate, is that there is a shock at the moment of um, the contract. So if you um, see this um, diagram, um, I wanted to put the stress on the difference between men and women. Uh, it could have been also interesting to show you the activity rate, but it was well, uh, it could be confusing to have too much uh, things on the same diagram, but you have to realize that women have um, also lower activity rate. It is because of the motive of migration. Um, most of women uh, uh, came in France for family reasons, and so at the beginning of their stay in France, they are inactive uh, and um, because of uh, family uh, obligations. And then um, their activity rate raises after a few years. But as you can see, uh, with respect to the length of the stay in France, uh, activity rate and unemployment rate here is increasing for men, but also for women, but it stays very low and very low compared to the native born. Um, in the long run, we can also use, of course, uh, labor for survey as OECD uh, has done, for instance, 
And um, uh, there is um, an increase, a uh, steady increase of employment rates, both for men and women, but they never catch up uh, native uh, employment rate. If we have a look to uh, employment rates by qualification and by gender, maybe you can uh, see that um, of course, there is a di difference between uh, genders, but also um, between gender and uh, qualification. Um, university degrees are more fav favorable for men at the beginning, and um, there is also a very um, important effect of um, middle uh, qualifications uh, for both sex. Uh, intimate, intermediate qualification, as you can see. And it is very interesting because uh, what we think is that uh, we need high qualified migrants. And there we can show that we need also intermediate qualified migrants. Uh, for uh, intermediate jobs, uh, we cannot uh, find um, uh, well-fitted fit, people in France. And um, I think it's very interesting to, to see that because we all have um, studies about high, qualification, high, high qualified migration and how to attract, to be attractive and so on. And even myself, I've done that. But here we see that there are other migrants, no low skills, no high skills, but in the middle. Maybe we, we can have some uh, reflections about it. Yeah. Um, well, if we compare with the population as a whole, for employment, um, an em employment rates, as you see, and uh, as I said before, uh, the employment rate uh, remains um, lower for third country uh, immigrants and for new migrants. New migrants are a part of third country yeah, in my um, presentation. And especially for women. Um, here, uh, employment rate for um, population as a whole and for um, immigrants is measured through uh, labor force survey and uh, the other variables from ELIPA. Um, we've done some multivariate analysis. Uh, this work is in progress in order to try to explain the differences. Um, what we wanted to show is the impact of skills in French language. Why? Uh, first of all, because well, uh, we all uh, know that there is an impact of the, the language skills to integrate labor markets, but also because there is uh, in the contract, the reception contract, there is uh, a lot of French uh, language courses, and um, it was a way to uh, assess the impact of. Uh, those uh, courses and so on. And what uh, we can uh, say is that for men, um, base, having basic skills in French has a very um, small impact or no effect on employment rate. Uh, what matters is origin, or, or the, the country of origin, the age. Um, it it are the, well the, it determines the employment rate. And for women, there is also a family structure to have children or not. 
But uh, at, at the opposite uh, is to be employed something important to have better skills in French. So we, we can show that uh, people having a job in uh, between the two waves of the, the survey, uh, when there are men, there is no effect on the French skills in French. We have to confirm it, of course. Uh, it's only first result. And there is uh, an effect for women. Um, what we found is that um, French lessons and so on have more effect on women than on men. But we have to take into account also uh, the language of the origin country, uh, the language for the childhood education. We have migrants sometimes who had uh, education in French, and so on. Um, but we can also investigate other um, determinants of employment rate. And for instance, we have done a um, study about network. That is to say, uh, is, uh, has the migrant relatives in France? Uh, has, um, has the migrant friends? And is this network is developing uh, during the stay in France. And we will try to show the link between the network and employment rate. But as you see, the effects um, of age and origin are heavy. So it is difficult to, to, um, to discover other effects. Hmm? Anyway, um, I'm not a policy maker, but what uh, I can tell you is, of course, uh, in France, um, we will go on putting the stress, yes, mm -hmm. putting the stress on um, language uh, lessons. Mm -hmm. And um, even with higher levels of um, um, skills, you know, A1 and A2 levels, if you know what is it. So, I'm sorry to be too long. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marie-Hélène, and, and, and sorry, we, we started a bit late, so we have to adjust the agenda, but I really think what you said about, you know, sometimes we just assume that labor market shortages are in the higher skilled workers, and it's not necessarily the case. So I think there's a very strong point about having, you know, uh, um, labor market analysis that tell us really the, the reality about the shortages on the labor market. But I don't want to speak too much because now it's your time. Uh, so I will, uh, in oh, first of all, sorry, is there any clarification question on, uh, on Marie-Hélène's presentation? Cla <laughs> clarification question? Yes, please. Ask. Thank you. Uh, the bars representing the employment rate across the education level for men, they are really all at the same, they all seem to be at the same levels. And so, uh, I mean, indeed, it's, if it's true, it's very interesting and surprising that it's people with uh, men without any education perform as well as those with the highest level of education. So is it due to some other differences hidden behind? Um, I think it's due to the type of jobs they, they get. Um, they often they, they get uh, low, um, low qualified jobs. So the, um, the initial uh, training doesn't matter. Because they all had employment rate around 80% or something, which seems yes. very high indeed. It is. Mm. 
surprising results sometimes. Okay, uh, thank you for that. So if there is no any further clarifi question, clarification questions on Maria Zelen's presentation, then uh, we can open up the, the debate. So it's your time. Um, I, uh, I think we could frame the debate, but it's pretty much up to you around two big issues. The first one would be really about uh, uh, understanding better the issues, about the sectors, about, I mean, any question you may have about really the, the um, you know, the vulnerable groups and the people. And then the second uh, part of the discussion could turn around the, uh, the changes and what do we need to uh, improve the quality of uh, policy in order to improve uh, the integration on the labor market. But that's up to you, I'm pretty much in your hands, so uh, please, who wants to uh, kick off the discussion? Gerk. I would, I would like to... Thank you. I mean, I have two very different comments, or well, the second is a question. The, fir the first was sort of started with David's observation that you think uh, the UK labor market, which combines little regulation and little control, is a good way for the migrants into the labor market. Of course, it's not a very nice finding, as you said. The, I mean, I was thinking about this. On the other hand, we have, an, we have evidence here that everything is determined by age and origin. I mean, which I found a very different result. I mean, what, what Maria Lenz said. I mean, that there is such a strong dominance of where one comes from, apparently, culturally, and so on. So, I mean, these are two findings. They are not easy to, to reconcile. They are also two different countries, admit, admittedly. But I was curious, you don't find this sort of strong strong impact of, because in the end, I mean, what Maria Lenz shows us is that even very low-skilled people find jobs in France. I mean, at roughly the same level as others, but apparently it's much more determined by, by this question of origin and, 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 and age. So I was wondering, do you find similar things that origin is so important or not? Uh, on the other hand, I'm, it's also a question to you and maybe to others, I mean, if this were true, what you say, how does it go together with the evidence we have in particular in the UK that, that mig migrants have very little impact on local wage levels and so on? I mean, we have this, I mean, the best studies we actually have, and I think at least the ones I know are all from the UK because everything is best researched in the UK and Europe. So, I mean, we have all this evidence showing that actual inflows of migrants hasn't put very much pressure on local wages and so on. I mean, which is not picked, apparently there is a different impression with government ministers, I mean, who occasionally make different comments on it. But I think it's a complex finding, I must say, because it's also a complex finding in terms probably of acceptability. Uh, my second question is, as I said, totally different and it's a new hobby of mine. And it goes to all the researchers here. Uh, if you do this longitudinal service on migrants, what do you do if a migrant leaves the country and goes to another country? Are you capturing this at all or they just disappear from the survey? Because I think that is an issue we need to look into, of course, if, particularly if you speak about migrants. I mean, we need to see migrants could also move to another country. And also, so I'm really a bit... I'm curious about this longitudinal service, but what happens if they leave the country? Thank you very much. Okay, so maybe first, David, you want to reply yeah. on the UK question and then we can open up on the second question. Sure, uh, no, what's being said is, is very important. I mean, you recall that my, my flexible labor market was actually, I was saying this was reasons to be concerned about the integration of immigrants, but you, but you can argue that it gets the immigrants jobs. And, and uh, the, the, the employment rate, for example, of the A8, the recent A8, is, is very high. It's, it's higher than the British, British workers. But you are right. Of course, the age and origin also matter. So, for example, uh, Bangladeshi workers, Bangladeshi women or Somali refugees, have got incredibly low employment rates. So, ab absolutely, even though we have indeed got, for better or worse, a flexible labor market, um, the Bangladeshis don't seem to uh, want, want to or, or are able to uh, participate in the labor market. So 
Uh, I mean, for me, the, the flexible labour market is a plus, but on, only if the minimum standards are enforced. And my, my issue is that really they're not being enforced, which I think, I think is uh, very serious, particularly for recent migrants. Just as an aside, on the, the most studies on the wage levels, which we've probably got seven or eight good studies now, do show that down the bottom end of the wage distribution there is an effect, but, but you're right, it's, it's, not, it's not all that large. And that's, of course, in part because of the minimum wage. That's, that's a particular reason why I'm exercised about the minimum wage not being enforced. Okay, and uh, anybody wants to jump on this? Yes, on the second question, maybe? Sure, so um, on the issue about, uh, about regulations, I think um, one thing that is potentially worth mentioning, it doesn't necessarily, so a flex, there's a, I think there's reasonably good evidence that flexible labor markets do encourage higher employment rates, particularly for the types of people that um, employers may, uh, may consider to be more risky, and that's the case for young people entering the labor market. This is just not, uh, this is not a specific issue with, with immigrants. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that the solution is to deregulate all of the labor markets in the sense that some, um, uh, if you look, some of the Nordic countries, for example, have used subsidized work experience programs. And that has a conceptually similar role in the sense that you are reducing the risk that the employer has to take on initially um, in order to, to help people get a foot in the labor market and then potentially work their way up. So there are, there are different ways of reducing those risks that, that employers initially take. On this particular question, yes. Um, well, um, I'll be happy to, to say a few words on this because uh, clearly that's, that's, that's mentioned. We'll have looked a lot at longitudinal studies in the different countries, and always, I'm like, you, you've seen the data from which Marie Lynn has presented on France. I'm like, you have uh, about 60% only have still are in your sample after a few years, and that clearly poses a question with respect to who goes out and so on. And, and one, that's one interesting finding when you look, for example, um, with respect to the crisis countries. Uh, the, Spain has very good data, for example, on their immigrants who leaves the, the country. And a lot of the people that we right now observe as Spanish emigration to other European countries are actually naturalized immigrants. Um, about, um, uh, last time we looked at this was about 14%, probably now we're more at about 20%. Um, and uh, and the, the, the huge bulk, but, but the most of them, when they move on, the naturalized uh, immigrants, they go back to their origin countries, they don't necessarily move within Europe, even though they're also overrepresented among that group. Um, and uh, precisely because the citizenship uh, quite often protects you also um, from, um, uh, in terms of if you want to go back, it's kind of like an insurance if things go bad when you move on uh, to go back. And it's quite often those people who are relatively well integrated, it's quite often the more highly skilled, and those who actually were in employment, not necessarily an ideal type of job, um, but who had perhaps short periods of unemployment. It's not necessarily the long-term unemployment, uh, long-term unemployed, the most vulnerable that will, that will do this kind of uh, return migration. That's at least what we saw. But maybe, okay. Marilyn, you. Okay. Well, uh, let, let, let me see if there is any other uh, questions or comments from the, from the floor. Yes? Yes, uh, I would like to ask uh, to what extent uh, there is a dimension of attractiveness of labor market. Is it, uh, for instance, a labor market, a national labor market in Europe uh, that attracts better migrants than another one because it's, uh, it provides more uh, better jobs or something? I mean, we look mainly from the point of view of migrants, but how migrants look the different uh, national markets and uh, does this affect their, uh, uh, the quality of, of migration in different countries? Yeah. Actually, if I may add to that question, because I think that's a very interesting question, also in terms of sectors, where, where are the sectors where we see better integration, better uh, uh, progression on the labor market could be another one. But I don't want to make it too complicated though. Anybody wants to jump on that one? Yeah? It will, it, uh, the, I don't know whether in a sense with this is linked to integration or not, but, but clearly the, the, more, the most valuable immigrants, I, I, I'll assert, are the ones who are highly skilled and who are coming for work. Now, in terms of, in terms of the, the British system, the non-EU 
is, is in some senses completely controlled now. And it's, in my view, it's controlled in a very sensible way. It's a very selective system. And uh, those people seem to integrate very well. I mean, in, in some sense, partly they don't use the health service and the uh, education system because they go private, a lot of them. Um, the family is under control. The family system is under control. The students are uh, under control. I mean, we, we welcome students very much, and even though sometimes, alas, the message on that gets lost. I mean, the, the much more difficult question, again, I'm speaking for the British, is what, what about recent less skilled uh, European migration? But as we know, those, the, the people, these people have got very high employment rates. And I, I surmise that that surely is a way in which you, you integrate. I mean, there, there, are lots of, <laughs> there are lots of stories uh, which go against this. You know, the poles are now taking all the fish, and instead of throwing them back, which is what fishermen do, they can take them home and eat them, okay? Which, you know, which causes problem, problems for the British anglers, the British fishermen, as it were. But, but these are anecdotes. I mean, the fact that you've got high employment rate, it's going to lead to better integration. Maya Elaine, you want to do something? Yes, uh, uh, just to say that it is not easy to, um, to assess uh, labor markets, to compare it from a point of view of a migrant, uh, because, uh, for instance, um, when you have um, such, we have in France, a lot of family uh, migrants, uh, they don't come because of um, the performances of labor market, but mm -hmm. We could uh, try to um, have some survey or, uh, for instance, in countries where people can choose, really choose. I, I think for Morocco, for instance, you can choose between uh, uh, Belgium or France because maybe you have relatives in Belgium and in France. And maybe uh, with such cases, uh, you can try to do something um, um, because it is very difficult. Of course, as maybe David said, for high qualified, you are on a market uh, problem, if, if you want. It is uh, with economic reasons and so on. But for uh, immigration um, on a general, um, it is not the case. So th they don't choose because uh, they know the performances and so on. It is because they have a cousin in the UK, for instance, or, uh, and they want to, to go there and so on. So it is difficult to have evidence. You wanted to come? Uh, yes, sure. I was just going to answer your question about the, the sectors because this was um, one of the major issues that we that we looked at in our in our study. And it, the the dynamics in terms of which sectors offer better jobs or better progression opportunities are um, are complicated and they vary a little bit across countries. Although if I'm allowed to kind of generalize, overgeneralize, um, I think if, if you look so if you look at two factors which are does a sector offer a lot of middle skill jobs for people to move into. And um, is that how easily, what, what do they need in order to get that? Can they um, get that experience on the job and move up, or do they need a lot of formal qualifications in order to take the middle skill jobs? Then I, I think there are some kind of broad observations that you can make. Um, so the, if you look at sectors, for example, like retail and hospitality, they tend not to require a lot of formal qualifications in order to move up, language ability may be needed. Um, but there aren't necessarily large numbers of middle skill jobs. Um, they tend to have, there are quite a lot of people at, at the bottom, and then a small number of people will gain upward mobility, but it won't be, this se the sectors aren't necessarily going to be a vehicle for massive um, gains for immigrants. Mm -hmm. That would contrast uh, a section that's often quite interesting as construction, um, because there are lots of jobs at the bottom, and there are also ways to move up into more skilled jobs on the basis of work experience without necessarily having to go off and get lots of formal qualifications. So con obviously construction has, has been torn apart by the, the crisis in, in many countries, but at least before the crisis it offered quite a lot of good opportunities. And then the third interesting sector I would mention is, um, is healthcare. Because it is, um, it's expanding, it has a lot of, it has jobs all throughout the spectrum at low, middle, 
and, and high skilled. The big issue with healthcare and the, the barrier for it um, to kind of allowing healthcare to be a real vehicle for upward mobility for immigrants is that it really does require uh, formal qualifications to make it out of the lower skilled jobs into into the middle yeah. skilled. And that you know, it's not impossible for immigrants to get those qualifications, but it requires some thought about how to make those pathways easier. And I think Thomas yeah. wanted to also uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Costas, for the question. Um, with respect to the attractiveness, I mean, like, I, and I would like to echo what what Maria Elena said. Um, it, I'm like, I think what what really, the, well, really, the issue is at the high skilled end, at the high skilled labor migration end, and here the issue of language is something that we sh simply should not uh, should not neglect. I think it's also one of the reasons why, for example, many of the Southern European highly educated that have been going to Germany have left the country again because of the language issue, which uh, which plays less perhaps in, the, in, the, in some of the more technical uh, occupations. Um, and with respect to the health sector, because it was mentioned, um, the, I'm like, clearly it's, it's a sector which is highly regulated for, for good reasons, uh, but it's also the sector where we have two observations. First of all, it's a sector where uh, recognition is uh, most, it's best developed, where most people go and take recognition precisely because of the benefits are high. And it's also a sector where there's been a lot of innovation uh, in terms of bridging courses and so on, and uh, including in countries like Portugal, which are perhaps not necessarily always in the focus of, uh, of a lot of people. But there's been a lot of innovation also in this field, precisely because every, every country has shortages in the sector. And when you get shortages and they get pressing, then you come up with innovative ideas. Okay, I think we have uh, arrived at the end of that session. I would like to thank you very much for your participation. Thanks to the four panelists that did a great job, and uh, just give them a big applause. I think they deserve it. <laughs>